Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories. We are with Charles Reed from Charles Reed Anderson and Associates. Charles, how are you doing? Doing very well. How about yourself? Fantastic. We're going to talk about well, one of the more interesting cutting edge technologies, Internet of Things today. We're going to talk about IoT, IoT in Asia. And also, well, your venture into becoming an entrepreneur, because that's a, a reasonably recent chapter in your story, isn't it? And a long, illustrious career that you've had as a consultant. Well, the long parts were correct, that's for sure. Illustrious, I think we're still determining that one. Well, we can work that out. Okay. But, oh, well, I mean, come on, you've worked... You worked in BT Global. You were your head of innovation for Asia Pacific. You were the former VP at IDC. You know, these are no... These are good names to, I'm sure you spent a lot of your time getting in and talking to large corporates and advising them on their strategies, right? Yeah, large corporates. I also deal with some of the uh, governments around the region as well to sort of advise them on what's going on and let them know what's real and what's smoke and mirrors, basically. Right. There you go. Well, help us out here. Do Do you consider yourself as an IoT consultant, IoT advisory? Yeah, I think IoT advisors more right. Um, I do some consulting work as well. Um, I used to be more of an analyst for the last four and a half, five years. Right. Um, but in reality, I wanted to get back out there on my own. That's why I started my own company. Because um, I want to try and drive the market forward. I think I have some ideas about uh, what's going to hold us back. And, you know, when you're an analyst, you sort of sit on the sidelines, you know, and you get to throw stones at people's houses and stuff. But um, what I wanted to do was try to play more of an integral role, um, be truly independent, complete vendor and technology agnostic and just drive the market forward. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to finding a bit more about that journey into becoming, well, an entrepreneur and running your own thing and doing all the things that you said that you want to do and the challenges that you face. It's never easy, is it? It's never a straightforward process. (laughs) No, I didn't expect it to be, though. Exactly. And it's a lesson. It's a learning curve, isn't it? Well, let's talk about IoT first. Talk to me and the listeners as if we don't know what IoT is. I mean, I spent 15 years in telecoms, but still when I hear IoT, I have to sort of step back a little bit because, you know, it's not only is it moving so fast, it's one of those sort of industries where, you know, okay, we need somebody just to tell us, okay, this is exactly what it is. This is what the definition is. So when you talk about IoT, what exactly are you talking about? The first thing I always tell everybody is it's just a buzzword. Um, You know, basically what we're doing is using technology um, as it evolves to improve business processes. It's the same types of things we've always been doing. Um, it's just that, as you know, most organizations like to slap a fancy buzzword on top of mm-hmm. it um, to drive up visibility. But these things have been going around for a long time. And even if you look at something like IoT, um, you know, it's, it started out by doing things like machine to machine. So think about just car tracking. That's been around for, what, probably 25, 30 years now. Um, it's just been evolving more and more. I think what's changed now, like when we went from that old machine to machine model to what we talk about with the Internet of Things, the things can now talk to each other. And um, I'll I'll give you an example on this one. So if if you look at container ships that come across from the U.S. um, to Hong Kong, for instance, um, they deliver potatoes. So what they started out doing was machine to machine. They would stick a sensor inside of those containers and that sensor would capture the temperature, you know, carbon dioxide levels and humidity levels and report it back. But then what would happen is the guy in the ship would say it's too warm in there. and He'd send somebody out to container number 5,000 out of 10,000 and have to go open a vent. So it was an improvement in the process, but it wasn't great yet. So what's happened now is now they've been um, with Internet of Things. You allow two separate things to talk to each other. So that same shipping company will now stick an automated uh, vent opener inside of that container. And then they'll have an analytics platform um, that sits across the top of it. And it'll know that once the temperature reaches this level, it automatically opens it. So what we're doing, these things are talking to each other and it gets rid of the inefficient component, which is us as humans. Right. So the human being is the weak link in that chain, right? Yeah. Yeah. This just simplifies it, automates it, um, and really just improves that process. And it's sort of a good step in the right direction. Can it ever be fully automated? I mean, I know... I mean, I use a lot of automation in our business, even here in Asia Tech Podcast. There's a lot of automation going on because it's just a process. And it's not necessarily the fact that you can't do it as a human, but it just takes the decision making out of it, right? Because decision making itself uses up energy. And then you've got a human being doing it. You know, they don't always make the same consistent decision in the same situation, right? Can it ever be fully automated? I mean, there has to be a human in there at some point in the IoT mix, right? 
Well, you always have humans involved up front. Um, you know, basically, they got to set up the systems that are going to be doing it. And even when you look at things like machine learning and deep learning, um, they, the machines have to be taught what is correct. So if you're doing video analytics on security footage, uh, you know, try to determine, yes, this is a male um, Asian between the ages of 35 and 45. At the beginning, it has to be taught that that's what it is. So right. there's always going to be roles. And this isn't a game where we're sort of going to reach it and go, boom, we're there. Everything's automated. We can now go back and start doing other things. It's technology. It's going to constantly evolve. There'll always be something new. Um, but this will keep us going for quite a while. Right. So the technology is there, but it kind of does the heavy lifting. A lot of the process, which the humans aren't very good at, and it allows, I mean, there's going to be human interaction in there anyway, but it sort of takes away all the other stuff, which, you know, yeah. we don't do very well. Yeah, so agree. container ships is a great example. I know one of the ones that are, is often bounded around is, you know, your fridge. We kind of hear it. May, maybe I too many smart fridges. <laughs> exactly. That's what I want to say. It's the one, it's the obvious one we hear every single time, but I haven't seen them yet in the average household. So when, when people talk about that, is that the kind of thing that, you know, you say, okay, actually IoT is not that, it's so much more than that. How do you respond when people come up with stuff, smart fridges? So I always say that this is part of the problem with the industry. We do too much technology for technology's sake. So we connect something just because we can. Right. Um, if you look at a fridge, it's great. I could be out there in a taxi and I can check and see that my fridge is low on milk. But the problem is I'm still low on milk. If it was a true solution, instead of just a piece of technology, they would start linking up that value chain. Um, so in Singapore, you know, I order groceries online. So if it knows it's low on milk, it would automatically stick it into my basket and arrange for a delivery when it knows I'm home. Mm -hmm. Then it starts to add value. But for now, it's just we're connecting these things because we can. That's a lot of the same problems we've had with uh, the initial versions of the smartwatches. If you look at things from Apple and oh, Samsung. Yeah. Um, we've connected it, but is there really a need? There's no apps yet for it. So it's basically just a notification. Um, so, but we've connected it. Is it really adding that much value to our everyday lives? I don't think so. Not yet. Hmm. Uh, if you take an example like that, I mean, I know you're talking about smartwatches. I think of an example. I mean, there's that whole sort of quantified self movement, isn't it? Where people are sort of not just measuring their heart rates, but they're also measuring their blood sugar and all sort of markers going on in their bodies. And, um, you know, some people have posited that you could connect that to your fridge. Oh, you're, you're low on blood glycogen? Oh, okay, I need to order you some of this, right? Some carbohydrates or whatever. I mean, that, is that sort of just real Star Trek stuff? Or do you see a time at some point in the future when that will actually become reality? Um, I don't know if it's going to be doing the ordering of food based on uh, your blood levels, but I do think some of the things you've, we see now around things like epigenetics, uh, you know, and processing the genomes where they can identify traits in your um, genes to figure out whether or not you have what type of exercise you should do, what type of conditions you're going to be at risk for in the future, uh, mm. which of your genes are turned on or turned off. Um, so that stuff gets very interesting. It's still early days, but I don't think it's that far away. I think, you know, another three to five years, you'll start seeing that really going into mainstream. Um, you'll see it through insurance companies, healthcare organizations as well. We'll start looking at it a lot more. So those types of things, it shouldn't be that far ahead. Um, but I think what we're looking for, we have the technology to do this stuff. Um, it's more about applying it to a problem or a process, and that's where we struggle. So, and I think what's happened with IoT is, you know, we can develop and secure any IoT solution right now. We don't have people who know how to look at a business process or a customer experience and backfill it with those technologies. Hmm. So it's sort of that gap in the market. Right. So still with the engineers, is that what you're saying, rather than the people yeah, who can kind of empathize with the users, so to speak, if I can even use yeah. that word? Yeah, there was this great uh, speech I saw, a guy named uh, Anil Manon. He's the head of Smart and Connected mm. Communities for Cisco. And um, he said, technologies or IoT is too important to be left to the technologists. Yeah, and I, I think, think it's yeah. great because it's like you just you need people in there. You need marketing to get involved, operations, um, finance, because someone's got to pay for it, senior management, and then also the end users. It's about bringing together different stakeholders. And that's where we're just starting to learn how to do it. Um, and for the most part, we're doing it pretty poorly today. Right. Do you consider yourself as a technologist, Charles? I mean, the reason I ask is I wonder if you do you use IoT in your everyday life beyond the obvious sort of applications? 
I, I wouldn't consider myself a technologist. So when it gets into the you know doing a reference architecture, I always pull in people who are the experts. Hmm. Um, I evaluate technology more based on whether I think it makes sense or not. Um, so I use some of the stuff at home. Some of it's been great. I love my Google Home. Um, on the other hand, I also had a smart plug that blew up in my wall in the middle of the night, and I came out there at three in the morning. There's smoke coming out of my wall. Right. <laughs> um, so some things I like more than others. Um, smart watches, I've tested a few in the fitness bands, and they always ended up back in the drawer. Um, mm. So I do use certain things, um, but not that many as of yet. But on the other hand, I mean, there's things that will start impacting my life because everything I'm, I'm using in my life involves it. So mm. even if you look at that, I'm, if I'm using public transport, it's all connected up. Um, in Singapore, you know, we've got uh, you know, toll pricing throughout the city, so that's always connected up. And you're starting to see it impact more areas of your life. And it doesn't have to always just be in your home. Right. I know you talk about smart cities. And for those people who are not familiar with Singapore, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of things are going on, especially with IoT in Singapore, for those who haven't visited recently, you know, how it's become a part of the fabric of your everyday life? Well, I think Singapore is pretty far ahead of the game on this one. I mean, everyone's probably heard about the Smart Nation project. And I think the government has done a better job than any other government I've seen worldwide um, about setting things up internally to support it. Um, adjusting it with curriculums in schools and starting to really plan for the future on it. It was just our Singapore's National Day yesterday mm. uh, when the Prime Minister came up and actually gave a speech talking about the importance of developing a smart nation for the future. Um, so when you get the leaders like that talking about the importance as one of the core initiatives that we need to drive as a society, um, people do take it more seriously. What Singapore has in its advantage is it's relatively small, um, when it comes to infrastructure, it's it's outstanding here. So they have everything set up already. They got the fastest broadband in the world. Um, it's easier for them to start adding solutions on top of it. Of course, when you look at any government, whether it's a, a nation like Singapore or it's an individual city like Taipei or Tokyo, it's complex. You've got dozens or maybe even hundreds of different groups within that government. Each of them wants to run their own initiative. So how do you pull it all together? But Singapore's done a good job. I mean, a lot of the things they're focusing are really things that are still infrastructure centric. So you're seeing a lot of things around predictive maintenance, asset tracking, um, the, the, the real big, the early phase ones. But even things like smart energy and smart buildings, they, they, you know, they own probably 80 percent of the buildings here in the country. So mm -hmm. it gives them a good opportunity to really leverage it. I don't think we've seen too much yet that is really citizen centric. So things are going to impact our lives as citizens um, on a day to day basis. So we're not walking by a digital signage uh, monitor and it's basically knows that it's me and sends me specific information or targeting it. So that stuff's not there yet. Um, but I'm sure it will be within, you know, the next five or so years. Yeah. What happened to all of that? I mean, if we go back to the, the real estate of advertising, you know, that was one of the things that people speculated would be a big thing for IOT, isn't it? You walk past the, the billboard hoarding and this thing would talk to you somehow, right? What, you know, originally it was, you know, going to be all done by SMS, but they realized that wasn't particularly effective. So it was then, you know, RFID. And now we're sort of here with, you know, short wave or short distance IOT. Where are we with that now? Is that something that's been tried and sort of put to bed because it was a bit Star Trek? And as you said, like the consumers weren't really sort of, you know, it didn't really add value to their lives. So where are we with that? Is that something that's emerging? Um, I th it's, it's probably one of my most frustrating stories if you look at it for the last 15 or so years. <laughs> I can remember during the 3G auctions back in the UK. Oh, yeah. Um, when they were talking about, I remember seeing this guy come in and present. He's like, you know, it's only a matter of time. We're going to be able to walk down um, through a mall and Starbucks will know you as you're walking by. And we'll know that your friend's there. It's going to send you both a message saying that we'll give you 50p off of, you know, whatever yeah. you want to buy. This, I mean, I, I saw somebody give that exact same example two years ago <laughs> in talking about 4G. And I'm thinking, we just haven't moved on. Right. And the thing is, digital signage, think about this. You, you probably walk past. You live in Tokyo. You're going to see dozens of them a day. When's the last time any digital signage actually made you initiate an action? Right, exactly. The problem is these things, we just dump in a USB, put it on a loop for a month and come and replace it. Where it can actually add value is when you understand how to do the dynamic content around it. Um, so there's some great examples in London um, in the tube um, through a company called Boldmine. Mm. They're probably the best I've seen at this globally. And what they actually do is they understand what's going on in the tube and the platforms. They know how many people are there. And they work with the people around Canary Wharf, the businesses there, that if there's a high volume of people on the platforms, they'll start running advertisements to get them to go visit a shop. So it could be a sushi place that's saying, come here and get 20% off your bill um, or whatever. And they're literally having to work with them, though, to not only do the technology, but also develop that uh, dynamic content and address the organizational impact it has on their companies. Because you need different processes in place to actually take advantage of it. 
Um, so there is examples where it works. They're few and far between. Right. Okay. Uh, have you seen, seen any examples which have really taken you back, which you didn't predict or, you know, have come really, you know, at you from left field, as they say in a baseball analogy? It's kind of like, you know, I never saw that in IoT, but that is amazing. It may be something that happened in Asia as well. Have you seen anything like that recently? Um, I, I'm still fascinated by drones and the capabilities of what we have with drones. Uh, I think you might know, like Singapore had the first commercial drone delivery through yeah. SingPost about a year and a half ago. Um, we, we had our national day yesterday. There's drones up everywhere. <laughs> and I, I like it. I think we're getting a little bit into the hype of the drones, but I think it's a great thing for doing things around remote sites, uh, doing security type solutions. Um, and I'm, I'm just fascinated by watching them, you know, flying around and how pretty much anybody can become a pilot of one of these things. Um, how the how does that count as IoT, though? Because you still need a pilot, right? I mean, it's just like yeah. flying on a, you know, RC plane, right? Uh, yeah, but you're leveraging the different components within it. So you might still have a driver um, or someone actually using the joystick to do it. But if you look at all the things that are connected on that drone, so it knows exactly where it is, how you're controlling the motor, how you know all the different levels of um, how the motor's functioning, that's where you start getting in those IoT type solutions on it. Okay, fantastic. So drones, what about, drones. I mean, Asia in particular, I mean, I want to talk about your journey in coming to Asia as well. Obviously, because that fascinates me, and I'm sure the listeners are going to be interested in that. But when you talk about IoT and Asia, is it just a case of, well, okay, it's a market of billions now, so you know, go play IoT engineer? Or is there something different in Asia qualitatively, which makes it exciting to you that may not be happening in other markets outside of Asia? Um, I, I think the reason I, mean, I think it's the most exciting market in the world. Um, I also think that the vast majority of the analysts, when they do forecasts, are incorrect and they understate um, the importance of Asia. You know, in particular, when you look at countries like Japan, uh, Korea, and more specifically, looking at China, just the sheer scale of the infrastructure investment and everything that's going on within China, not only in the tier one, but in the tier two and tier three cities, it just it's really driving the whole market. Um, so when I look at IoT in Asia, I basically look at China and then the rest of Asia because I just think they're two different markets. Mm. Um, what you end up getting is that there's a lot of different dynamics here that excite me. Number one, you got about a billion people now moving into the middle class. Um, that means that there's going to be a lot more investment in all different types of infrastructure. They're going to have more dispensable, uh, disposable incomes. So it'll really start driving the economies. But you also have some compelling events. You know, you have Olympics coming up in Korea and in Japan, which means those two countries are going to invest heavily to try to showcase the technology around it. And I'm sure Tokyo is going to be keen on being the most connected city in the world by 2020 for the Olympics. Sure. Um, so those things drive it. You got Singapore leading in smart nation. You've also got a lot of the IoT technologies coming out of here. So if you look at the hardware, um, you know, you get it in basically in Taiwan. Uh, you know, you get it over in China and it gets pretty exciting. All the chips are made over here. So I do think um, it's quite, you know, a massive opportunity, especially when you get the scale. You know, you got 1.4 billion people in China, I think 1.3 in India. There's a lot of room for growth and there's a lot more uh, things that should be happening in the future. Right. Is there sort of a, a mindset difference as well when people approach these new technologies in Asia? You know, in the sense that, I don't know, I mean, we can talk about that in the, the context of entrepreneurialism, but that's, you know, let's save that for the, the second half. But, you know, in terms of people, so okay i'll use this technology is new or you know let's just go straight to iot and you know leapfrog everything else in in the way do you, how do you see that in asia compared to other countries that may be you know more economically developed well i think what you get here is that because of places like china they're growing so much they're building so many new buildings so they can leverage the latest technology it also means that buildings are going up with the latest technology as their infrastructure already so they have that head start um, so maybe it's not a complete green field environment, but a lot of the buildings are now. So it allows them to leverage um, technology going forward. Um, I think where I do get a bit worried is we, we do still it doesn't have the same like most of the countries here don't have the same entrepreneurial spirit that you get out of the U.S. I think that is changing um, mm -hmm. and Western Europe, of course, as well. Um, but it's changing. Um, I think what's happened now, because so many VCs have come into the region, people are realizing that you don't have to have the normal conservative career because that's traditional. If you look at the way some of the bigger economies um, and how people worked 20 years ago in places like Japan and Korea um, versus the, what they're looking at doing now, it's quite different. Yeah, So exactly. And I think we're still at an early stage, really. I mean, even if you take Singapore, I mean, there haven't really been any significant exits, but 
you know, the whole sort of startup thing is relatively new, isn't it, in terms of like building the incubators and accelerators and so on. So everybody's still going through that pipeline, if you like, in these Asian countries. So we still haven't seen, and everybody says it's all, all the unicorns are in the US and so on, and all the, the role models and case studies are there. But, you know, Asia's catching up very quickly. I definitely agree on that one, especially when you look at things like fintech. Um, you know, even if you look at some of the companies out here, the DBS has been ranked as the world's most innovative bank for the last couple of years. Um, they're a big driver behind fintech. I mean, Singapore's got, I mean, I don't even know how many fintech startups now. I think there's probably too many. I think we're almost at the risk of having a little bit of a bubble in it. Um, but it is one of those areas. People just can get the money. They can go out there and try it and see if it works. And because of the technology proficiency of the Asian markets, it's an attractive market to go after. Now, uh, Charles. Forgive me if I get this wrong. I'm going to take a punt here because I'm curious about how you ended up in Asia. But it sounds like to me, and I say forgive me if I get this wrong, you're from the east coast of the U.S. Um, close. It was more the Midwest side. So I, I grew up Chicago? in uh, Chicago. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. So Athens I thought I could place the accent. Right. Okay. So you grew up in Chicago. How did you end up in a place like Singapore? I mean, I know you mentioned off air there was a number of countries involved. Can you give us like, you know, was it something that you thought was always part of your master plan that you were going to head out to Asia? Or did you just kind of end up there? I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. So I'm still <laughs> trying to figure that one out. So it's just it's all just been part of a journey. Um, I didn't start my career in technology. I was in banking for the first, you know, until I was almost 30. Um, so, you know, I used to work doing securitizations, you know, doing project finance and oil and gas, um, went to grad school in Holland. That was just cause I wanted to live in Europe for a while. I thought, yeah, I'll try Europe for a couple of years. And then next thing you know, I got an offer to go to London, thought I'd stay there for a year or two that turned into 10 years. Um, but then after 10 years of London weather, um, mm. decided that, yeah, it's definitely time to go somewhere where the sun shines. So, Enough. uh, made to move out to Asia. And then you, you went straight to Singapore or how did that work uh, quick stop off in Malaysia. Uh, my wife had a position up there. Um, well, she's working a project up there. She's based out of Singapore. Um, so we stopped through there for a bit and then came down here. So right. it was more of a little bit of a break between jobs for me. And then I came down and started working in Singapore. Okay. So how long have you actually lived in Asia? Uh, it's my ninth year now. Right. Could you ever foresee life back in Chicago? I mean, have you been back to Chicago recently? And you sort of, now that you've been in Asia long enough, you can really understand it. If you ever go back to Chicago, do you sort of, you know, see things differently now? Uh, like how things I, are, I, like I, business That's, that's been so? for a long time now, I think. So it's just, uh, it's getting harder every year. So I, I go back to see my mother and that's about it. Um, but basically, you know, I have no intention of ever going back. I think the market here is just too exciting. Yeah. And uh, if I did this job that I do right now in the U.S., I'd have one demographic group to really look at one type of company, you know, whereas I'm out here in Asia, I've got everything from the most technology proficient countries in the world of Japan and Korea. And I've got places like Myanmar. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like you have to know everything and what the impact is and what drives these different markets. Um, so business wise, it's, it's challenging to keep up with it all. But it's also that's the excitement I need, because I'll never be able to master this. I don't think anybody ever could, because it's just too vast. And it includes all the different ranges of the spectrum. So it's far too exciting out here for me to ever consider going anywhere else right now. And do you see it easier to, I mean, you talk about the excitement. Do you see it easier to get meetings in like in Asia with Asian companies based on the fact that you have set yourself up as an authority in IoT? But, you know, if you were to do that back in the U.S., would it be a different equation? Would people, you know, be more as receptive as they are to you in Asia, you know, and, and listen to your story and, you know, your ideas and your insights and so on? Um, it's a good question, actually. I haven't really thought about that one. So I, I think it's never that easy to get meetings anyway. I don't think we're, wherever you are in the world, um, you still get a lot of the same dynamics, whether you're going to be in the U.S. or in Asia. Some people will be happy to talk to you because they want to change their business or they're concerned about the competitive environment. Some people just want to keep doing the status quo and don't have time or the day to meet with you. So I think those things are relatively similar. Um, you know, where I have success here is pretty much because people realize I'm one of the few independent minds out there mm. uh, where I'm, I don't really have an agenda. I'm not trying to push one vendor or one technology against another one. Um, I want everyone to succeed. I just want the market to go forward. Um, so I think that type of message should be, you know, open in any different market. But, you know, it's going pretty well for me out here in Asia. Well, let's talk about that if we can. I mean, you your background is. You know, I know you talked about working in banking and, and finance, project finance, for example. But even, even more recently, you know, you, you worked for BT Global, part of British Telecom Group, which was essentially a nationalized 
uh, telephone company, right, in the old days. So it still yeah. had that kind of culture. Then you moved to IDC, you know, one of the world's biggest advisory consultancies and so on. And now you started on your own, setting out Charles Reed Anderson out there on your own. Tell us a little bit about that transition because you, you said you voluntarily did it because you wanted to get out there and drive the market forward. But I, I wonder if it was a straightforward process for you. Was it sort of an easy thing to do? You know, tell us about your feelings when you actually went through that and just said, right, I'm going to go out and do this on my own now. It's one of those things I've been thinking about for quite a few years. Um, so in my last couple of years at IDC, I probably knew it was coming up. Um, so I started to think about how I would do it. I would look at the market and see what the opportunities were. Um, but what I just wanted to go out and do was try it on my own. Um, it gives you a lot more flexibility in your schedule. You can research the things you want to become an expert in. You know, you can eliminate a lot of the other stuff that you don't like to do. Um, and I just thought it would be kind of fun to work for myself for a while. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at my career, I mean, I've also worked for Vodafone. You know, I've worked for O2, um, Morse with his consultancy in the you know, UK. So I've gone through a number of different jobs. Um, I kind of like the idea of just doing things my own way anyway. Um, so this is a great chance to do it and see if I can make a success of it. Right. How is your day differently on the micro level, you know, from when you were working? I mean, I'd like to take it back to BT Global as an example, right? Because, again, as I said, the culture would have been entirely different to what you're experiencing now, right? I mean, how do you feel? I mean, because well, the reason why I want to talk about this is because I imagine there are people who are listening who are on the other side who are sort of staring out the window, you know, maybe working for a large corporate or so on, thinking, oh, well, I'm not sure if I can do this. But it's always the story of, you know, oh, I heard this guy, Charles Reed Anderson, talking about his journey, and that really inspired me, and it planted a seed, and I thought, wow, I can do it as well. So I'm just curious about how that is actually for you on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you sort of give us an insight into a little bit of that? Yeah, but like, I, honestly, I find it fascinating. Um, but you have to be very diligent. But I mean, luckily, I've worked um, from home in a number of my jobs, so I'm used to being able to work in this environment where it's just me on my own. And I don't sit there and watch TV during the day. You know, I, I pretty much start by about 7, 7.30 in the morning. Um, what's different now is I only take a break about midday or so and either go to the gym or go for a bike ride. Um, so, and then I come back and work later on. Um, it can be partially scary because things take longer than you think. Um, it's never as easy as you would hope it would be. But it's very rewarding because, you know, you're doing it all on your own. And when certain customers hire you, you realize they're hiring you. They're not hiring right. um, some company that you work for, some reputation that company has, or what they think they can get out of the company. It's purely you. So if you can make that a success, it's, it's, it's a very rewarding feeling. Mm. Um, but like I said, it is challenging. Um, what I always said when I did it is if I was going to start something on my own, I wanted to make sure I build skills that in case everything goes pear-shaped, I'd be in a better position to get a job. And I know that already right now that I'm, you know, if, if this doesn't work out, which I'm pretty sure it is going to, so I'm not too worried about it, I could just go out there and get a job if I needed to. So I wasn't going to end out back at ground zero on this one. Right. So you have a bit of a safety net there. But are you ever scared going out and doing this on your own? Of course. Pretty much every day you think about it. Um, you know, it's because it, you're on your own, you don't have a team of people around there doing everything for you, like to help out with the sales process and all those connections. And you don't have people doing all the admin. So there's always stuff to be done. Right. Um, you always feel like, you know, it was a holiday yesterday, but I still did a bit of work in the morning. Um, on the weekends, I normally work um, for a few hours a day. Um, it's just, it just becomes part of your life. So you gotta try and balance it. Um, and yeah, of course it makes it nerve wracking because you know, your only income is when you can actually um, sell a project to a customer or go on a retainer somewhere. So there is that kind of a pressure. Um, but then again, you know, you always had, you know, in my other jobs, I always had targets I had to hit. So you had those same pressures. Um, you know, if you didn't reach this target, you wouldn't get your bonus. So, you know, you get used to it, I think. So hmm. it's just a different type. Yeah. And it is some people either, you know, fail in that environment because they, they cannot cope with it's not just the pressure, but the fact that they don't have the structure, which was once, especially if you know you've lived so long in a corporate world, everything's sort of planned out for you, isn't it? And once you then go into this environment where, okay, you wake up in the morning, you can do what you want. You could watch TV all day, or you could send emails or do whatever, right? And in that environment, some people don't do very well, do they? Because you know it has to be sort of laid out for them. But in your case, I think, you know, you're, you're out there, you're building this authority and building your name as the IoT guy, essentially, as you say, that people buy people, right, at the end of the day. 
mm-hmm. what do you find in terms of your activities really works for you in terms of building that authority and getting out there? Because, you know, you don't have the marketing budget of an IDC or anybody like that, right? Yeah. So what works for you? Um, I do a lot on social media. Um, I mean, I've always been... I, I always read a lot anyway, as far as like all the new reports, any the news every day. I probably spend an hour at the beginning of the morning just going through what's happened in technology in the last 24 hours. Um, so I try to comment on that a lot, stay out of the curve. But also I tend to address different things. I mean, I don't cover just the technology side of it. I want to I have uh, feelings and beliefs about why we will fail doing certain types of initiatives. And it's much more about the operational structures, um, organizational impact. Um, so I try to focus on those things. And if you become an expert in it, you can show some value people sort of, you know, they relate well to it. Mm. So how, how does that work out? You take something like IoT and then you sort of talk about the cultural, organizational issues about IoT? How, how does that work? So I just wanted to get a bit deeper into what you said about how these things actually fail. Okay. So if you look at um, a given solution, like I said, we can develop anything we want right now. Um, but the problem is if you look at the vendors who are selling these solutions, they're going in there and talking about their product to a customer. So say I wanted to buy... Um, let's just say a predictive maintenance solution for a manufacturing plant. Um, all these big vendors go in there and say, you should be running it on this type of a network. You should be buying this product from me. But in reality, there's multiple products from multiple vendors that have to come together um, to actually create that single solution. So basically, you need to have this collaboration within the vendor community for it to actually work. Now, conversely, if you look at the customer side, um, that's normally going to be that decision is normally made by IT. But now it's starting to move over to the line of business. So now you need to get business people talking with technology people. You need to get strategy people. So you need that internal collaboration going as well. And it's addressing these things to understand that we need to change the way we normally do this. The problem is almost all the technology vendors come from a product world where they go out and sell their product. Mm. They're not as comfortable when their product is part of a bigger solution. And it's difficult for some of the biggest brands in the world to go in there realizing they're not going to be the front um, of the, of the, or the one that to choke for the customer. The customers tend to want to buy from operational technology companies. So now they're sort of on the back burner um, and they're just selling product to them that way. So it's a real different type of an environment and I want people to understand it. So I work with a lot of the technology vendors trying to explain to them it's not enough just to talk about the technology. You have to explain to the customers the organizational impact, um, the financial implications of these things, how it's going to impact their strategy going fa- forward. It's that more solution selling model. So it's really taking a just instead of just viewing this as I've now connected a widget, let's go sell it. Um, it's trying to understand what's going to prevent it from happening. And a lot of that is just getting teams to work together better. Right. I imagine that the solution is cultural, isn't it, within these organizations? It's how they're organized. You've got a guy who's going out and selling widgets. That's his job, right? Yeah. So you need to come in at a different level somehow and change the DNA, don't you? And that's a tough task i imagine i mean you know going way back to your o2 or vodafone days these companies even though they exist in the fast moving world of technology they don't change overnight do they and there's a lot of internal resistance if i'm the guy selling the widgets you know why do i want to now talk about solution selling you know that must but be they've tough. been going through this for quite a long time now. if you look at ibm has probably been trying to become a solutions type organization for 20 years and they are better than they used to be but there's they haven't reached that objective yet so there's still a long way to go for everyone Charles, I want to talk about something that you posted recently, if I may bring this into the conversation, because I think it's a, you know, it's a really nice insight, especially for people who are considering, you know, following the path that you've blazed, the trail that you've blazed from moving from, you know, the salaried life to starting your own thing. You posted an article entitled Five Lessons from My First Few Months Running Startup running a startup. And this was, I think, at the time about seven or eight months into your uh, you know, your new business, yep. which you've been doing for just under a year now, right? Yep. So there's some really interesting points in that. I want to sh- talk about those with you because they're not the obvious ones that you see when people say, here's my advice when you're going to start a business. And people say, oh, yeah, never give up and follow your passion and all that kind of thing. But you've come from a different angle here. So I think that's kind of refreshing. And the first one I find really interesting is build your circle of skeptics. <laughs> yeah. That's so, sort of, go on, tell us a little bit about that. I want to sort of give my own explanation. I want to hear from you first. I, so, well, I'm a firm believer that like, I, I, there's certain areas where I know that I'll probably know more than a lot of people. 
But in a lot of other areas, I am far from the expert. So I always try and find somebody who knows that area better than me. So like when I was developing my marketing collateral, I had a brand expert looking at it who just ripped me apart. Um, and she's actually a good friend, which is nice because she also felt comfortable enough to do it. Mm. But when you get those circles of skeptics, they're the ones who are going to go out in your business and really question it is, are you making the right calls? Because it's very easy to sort of go down a path where you just think you know the right answers. Um, but you, I like having people question everything that I'm doing because then I have to justify it not only to myself, but to them. And it basically helps you identify when you're going down the wrong path. And I mean, to be, in all honesty, I mean, if, if I would have talked to you a year ago, I would have told you that I'm going to be doing these five things in my mm. business. In reality today, I'm doing two of those and I'm doing quite a few things that are completely different I didn't even think about um, a year ago. So how, how did you make that decision? Was that something that somebody had looked at and said, you know, a skeptic had looked at it and say, hey, Charles, you need to focus on these or did that come to you naturally? Uh, it was a combination of it. Uh, so one of the other advisors that I use um, helps me go through these things a lot. And we, we talk about what's working and what isn't working on a regular basis. Um, and it's just the idea. Like I've realized something that I thought was going to be um, – that I would make a lot of money out of doing like, some repeatable type business wasn't working out. And I started to understand. We talked through why it wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that, I just started focusing on other areas and I found new ways to go to market and services that people wanted. Um, you know, one of the other ones that popped up, which was very strange, is that I, I, I always assumed that because I was an analyst uh, with IDC, people would have thought that I was independent. But I ended up getting a lot of calls from new customers who I didn't know when I was at IDC who wanted to talk with me when I left. Because now that I've left them, I left IDC, they thought I was independent. Mm. Um, so I think I didn't understand what the market really thought of me. Um, so you know, there's a good learning to go through. Um, yeah, and, and, and like I said, it's been, it's, I've changed my tact quite a bit because of it. How, how do you structure that? Because what you're talking about here, building your circle of skeptics is, is an uncomfortable activity, but a necessary one. And when you're starting your own business, it's easy to get into your groove and your rhythm and then you get comfortable. So you, you, you know, unless it's sort of structured, if it's an ad hoc thing, then you kind of avoid it, right? Or you yeah. know, it, you do it when you want to do it rather than when you need to do it. So how do you do that? Do you have sort of, right, Tuesday night, I'm meeting my skeptics, or is it done another way? How do you actually do it? Because I'm thinking then it becomes actionable advice for somebody else looking at it and think, okay, I need to do that as well. Well, one guy that I use as an advisor, I probably meet up with at least every two weeks, uh, whether for a quick drink or we have a call. Um, and he's been great at helping me to like, identify what's working, what isn't working, who I should be talking to and providing some introductions there. It's about getting those regular meetings scheduled. Also, if you're looking at going into an area and trying to release something new or like, like for me, it was about trying to create some new collateral that was going to be my new marketing message. Um, finding somebody who's really the expert on that other side, the person I would be selling to. Um, so they could actually say, well, this is what I think of it. This is what you're not addressing. And just don't think you have all the answers. Go out there and find people who can sit there and tell you what works and what doesn't work. Right. And, but it's, it's, you have to be open to it. And I always ask for people's opinion about what I'm doing and try and get them to give me insights. And how does that work? Do you pay these people for their time or is there some other kind of, you know, barter going on? A lot of times it's people who, I mean, I'll probably advise them on certain things for their businesses as well. Right. Um, so they, most of them happen to be friends. Uh, you know, I've got some uh, great friends out here who work as leaders in not only in technology, but not just in marketing. Um, so we all sort of help each other out because a lot of us are also doing smaller startups. Um, so we can talk to each other. They can tell me what they learned because they're a couple of years ahead of me of having their own business. Um, and it's really like almost a sharing economy. We just try and help each other out because we want each other to be successful. Exactly. And you got to ask as well. That's the important thing as well. Yeah. Okay, there's a couple more points in there. We won't go through all five of them. But the ones that really jumped out of me, avoid list. I thought that was really interesting. You talk about Warren Buffett's 25 five rule for people that don't understand what that is, or have never heard it. Can you sort of share what that rule is about and how that sort of advises you on your daily basis? Uh, I'm not sure if this is a true story or not, but it's kind of an urban legend. and You can find it online in plenty of different places. But um, the idea is that you should list out the 25 things that you'd like to do with your business um, and then rank the top five. And those top five, that should get all of your focus. Mm -hmm. And the remaining 20 um, should go into a list, which is basically your avoid at all cost list. And the idea is that if you start focusing on too many things, you'll get distracted. Um, so the problem is I love doing certain things that aren't in my top five. Um, so they take away from time. 
um, that, that I should be focusing on other areas. So you have to be kind of ruthless about this one. You can adjust that top five over time, um, but you really need to try and make sure you're focused in doing it. It's one of the biggest risks, I think, of being an entrepreneur is trying to do too much. Um, and I've made some of those mistakes already um, as well, but I'm trying to learn from it, at least share my learnings from it. So, so you list out 25 activities or 25 goals. How does that work? Um, I just started going through and saying, what types of things do I want to do for my business? What types right. of things are important for building it? So part of it could be, I need to have um, a point of view on this area, which means I know I have to do some research around it, a mm -hmm. specific topic. So I do a lot of research around low power WANs, for instance. Part of it could be, well, for my business, I also need to, uh, I don't know, say I work with my accountant or whatever. Like you just, you list out your activities. Um, but if it's, it could be speaking at public events. But I, sometimes I speak at public events where they're paid for events and sometimes they're freebies. I have to try and limit the freebies because there's normally travel involved and it takes away time. And they're fun. I love being on stage and I'm talking at events. But sometimes you really need to really cut back to it. So it's a matter of just, like I said, providing that focus um, on what you really need to do to be successful. And don't get caught up in those things that are doing it just because they're fun to do. So how do I know? I mean, if I'm an entrepreneur doing my own thing, building my own business like you... How do I know which ones should be in the top five? Because I'm naturally going to gravitate towards the ones which I enjoy, right? Or comfortable with. I know I can master these ones. Rather this than the is ones all that about being truthful uncomfortable. to yourself. Yeah. I, yeah. I think this is the one. Like, you should know what you need to do to be successful. Um, if, you know, like if I look at it and I said, I should go out and do as many freebie events as I can because they're fun, I know I'm lying to myself. Right. Um, so it's a matter of how do you actually identify them. Um, think about what's going to build your core. And when, when I look at different initiatives, I also break it down. I say, is it, is it core to my offering? Is it building my brand? And is it um, going to make me money? Obviously, because you want to make money out of it. And when I value, evaluate different initiatives, because I do have a number of partnerships I work with, that's the little scale that I use. And unless it comes up very high you know, on brand, core, and money, um, you really don't want to do it. You know, I've turned down things that would have been relatively lucrative, yeah. um, but because they weren't my core, and I don't think they would help my brand, it really just would distract from my business. Yeah, that's the tough part, isn't it? I, I'm a great believer that for entrepreneurs, you've got to say no to grow. It's easy to say yep. yes to everything and chase everything. I mean, a great example that you talk about is speaking gigs. Yep. Because th there's, a, there's a lot of ego involved in that, isn't there? That's, oh, yep. yeah, I'm speaking. But you can easily, a, a speaking gig is a day you know, of your time, even though you may only be there for a couple of hours, you know, you've got to prepare, you've got to travel and all that stuff. And, you know, it kind of the distraction means you don't get a lot left over. But you get invited to a speaking gig. And at the end of the day, what do you get that whole day? If it's not the, you know, core gig for you, it's not a core event for you, you could have used that time otherwise. So it's tough, isn't it? You've got to say no to that, because you're also saying yes to something else, which is a lot more, as you say, a lot more focused and key to growing your business in that top five. So do you remind yourself about this stuff regularly? Because it's easy to kind of like get lost, isn't it? And, you know, go with the flow. And do you sort of go back to your 25 list on a regular basis and update it and so on? Yeah, um, I have to. That's what, It's funny because when I wrote that article, actually, I it was after my first, I said it's my first six months and it was actually written in month eight just because there was other things that were a priority. Um, so like for this week, I'm like, literally, I'm almost breaking it down on a weekly basis and I've taken over all the windows in my office here and I just have writing all over it. I'm constantly moving my lists around because I know what mm -hmm. I got to get done this week, what I can push off or whatever. So, um, but you're right about like the speaking events ones. I think like, when I was at IDC, I spoke at 150 events yeah, over four years. And what I'm trying to do now is keep it down to about 10 a year max. Mm -hmm. And I try to just do the larger events. Um, I was conference chair at IoT Asia. I'll be conference chair at Editor Things uh, World Asia in Singapore as well in October. They're the bigger one events. So those I can invest the time in because it's good for the brand. A lot of the other ones I have to say no to now because it'll just take up too much time. Right. The, dy the dynamic is different as well. Isn't it? As at IDC, I guess going out and speaking, it was seen as part of your job and you know that was part of your brand building for IDC, right? And that was almost kind of like a, a metric in a way. Like if you're going out and speaking 150 events, you know, you're doing something right. Whereas what you're talking about now is that you know, you, you have less flexibility in, in working for yourself, right? You, you don't have a big company behind you to back you up. So you've got to go out and be f completely focused on the events that work for you. But it's also those best days. I mean, when I was at IDC, if I spoke at an event for free, um, I was still getting paid. From exactly. IDC. If I'm not, I'm not getting paid by myself today. So don't, you know, it's if I'm going a freebie event, there's nothing there. And it takes away from what I should be doing to build my business. Just before we finish, Charles, it's been really 
informative and insightful talking to you and finding out your journey, not just, you know, around the world, but also in starting out and doing your own thing. The last point, I don't know if it's the last one, one of the last points you put on your, your five list, which I think is really insightful, was life as an entrepreneur takes its toll, so find your escape. Yes. Are you actually any good at that? Because I always find that entrepreneurs often give this advice, but then, you know, and it makes complete sense. But when it comes to themselves, they're like the worst people to take their own advice when it comes to taking time off. How do you get on with that? Um, I build it into my day. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, I'll, I'll take a break and go to the gym um, or I'll go for a bike ride pretty much every day. Um, so I'm really good at working out about six or seven days a week right now. And I never had that dedication before, but I know it's important. I feel better mentally. I need that break during the day as well. Um, and let's face it, if I get out, at least I'm around some people then, because a lot of times when you're working from home, you know, you really don't have any social interaction. So it's always good to see people every once in a while. Mm, yeah, exactly. I like the way you're talking about, you know, going out and do the bike ride or going to the gym. That's what I do as well. I mean, I do, you know, I often find that my, I've got a dead time in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. maybe between 11 and 2, maybe there's some, you know, reason why my body is slumped or my energy levels are slumped. So I go out and I do like a two-hour bike ride or a three-hour yeah. bike ride and it works. Can I finally get so much more done because I'm not sort of, you know, if I was to stick around and stare at the screen for those three hours, you know, I would get less done at the end of the day. So I think that's the key, isn't it? You've got, you've got to be not afraid to do this. And I think that's the problem with entrepreneurs, isn't it? You've got to be constantly busy. You've got yeah. to be not afraid to sort of section your day up and say, right, these are my power hours. I do my stuff here. I take time off here and then I'm back. Because you have to be fresh in this stuff. And you need, like, what I like about the idea of the exercise thing is if you're out there, and especially since you ride as well, you know, when you're on that bike, it's just you. Uh, if you're up by yourself, then you're still thinking. It's not like you're not thinking about work. But it gives you time away from everything else to just look at a problem. And you might be running it through the back of your head while you're cycling for a couple of hours. Um, and you come back and you've suddenly come up with a solution. Whereas if you sat in front of the screen for another two hours, emails would come in. Uh, you read an article about this. You might start doing something else. It gives you time where you just your mind can just think without anything. You know, I mean, Obviously, you want to concentrate on the road so you don't crash. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it gives you the time for that little uh, mental break to just sort of think of things without the stress of seeing what comes up on the screen. Yeah, that's great advice. Before I ask you to share with us some links so people can find out a bit more about you, I'm curious as Singapore is a cycling destination. I mean, I cycle all the time. I do triathlons and proper long cycles. What was it like in Singapore for cycling? Is it a great place to get out on your bike? Um, it's bloody hot. I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> so every day, basically, if I'm going out at midday, the heat index is normally about 40. So it'll be about 32 to 33 degrees. But I kind of like that if I do a shorter ride. If I want to do a longer ride, you got to get out in the mornings. But then it's still going to be start at about 24 degrees, 25, and it'll go up to about 30 by the time you're finished. Um, so it's hot. Um, I like it for cycling. Um, it's you know it's pretty safe on the roads. It works. Mm -hmm. I'm, I live on an island off of Singapore called Sentosa, so it's great to ride around here. I can ride on the beach. There's some good climbs on it. Um, so it is a good variety. To be honest, though, you'd probably get bored because you'd do the island in a loop, and then you'd be doing that every day. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot more fun cycling up in Japan for that. Right. Fair enough. But hey, you know, the traffic here is horrendous. But that's a different story entirely. Charles, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I'm sure people want to find out a bit more about you, you know, your business, and also keep up to date in terms of where you're going to be speaking as well. I know you'll say you're cutting back, but you're still going to be out there chairing these IoT events. So where do we go? Give us a couple of links that we can go and check out. Okay, my website is charlesreedanderson.com. Uh, it can be found on Twitter at CRA Singapore. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well under Charles Reed Anderson. I think I am the only Charles Reed Anderson, so it shouldn't be too hard to find me. Fantastic. We put all those details in the show notes. Charles, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show today. And thanks for coming on and sharing your story, your journey, and your advice for everybody. I'm sure they're going to be inspired just by listening to what you have to offer. Please come back on as well. I'd love to have you back on in the future because you're not even a year into your first business, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be fascinating to see, you know, once we're on the other side of the year, how things are working out. Because like as you said, you start off with these five things, you're focused on two things. It's a fast evolving thing, not just IoT, but you know, running your own business. So please come back on. I'll be very happy to do that. And trust me, I think in the next two months, there'll be some interesting announcements that you'd probably want a good update on. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.